So let's pick it up right where we left off in the book of Hebrews chapter number four. Hebrews chapter number four. Out of all of the Bible studies that uh, God has led me in and, and with for uh, 43 years, um, I, I don't, I, I've not enjoyed one any more than studying the book of Hebrews. First time I've ever preached through the book of Hebrews and I'm just learning, man, how power-packed full it is. When I first started, I thought, well, God, um, you know, the link and the tie is so much to the Old Testament. How am I going to make this applicable to what we're facing today? And how do we make it culturally relevant? Uh, all of that stuff, and I'm letting all of that, but I'm going to tell you what, uh, this is more apropos than anything I think I've looked at in a very, very long time. Last Sunday, uh, we, we talked about don't miss your Canaan. And don't miss Canaan. And, and it was representative of the nation of Israel coming out of Egyptian bondage, got into the wilderness and got to griping, moaning, groaning, complaining about everything and wish we'd have stayed in Egypt, wish we'd have stayed in Egypt. God said, well, if that's what you want, if you don't want to go to Canaan, then you won't go to Canaan. Okay. And, and, and so he said, because of your unbelief, because you won't believe my promises, because you don't think that I know best, then you stay in the wilderness. Now you're still saved, you're still going to go to heaven. But you won't come into the fullness of everything that I have for you. Today I've entitled the message, Don't Miss Your Rest. A little different than don't miss Canaan. Uh, anytime that you see where the word of God gives word after word, the same word multiple times in the text, you really need to perk up and, and take notice because God's trying to really get across something extremely important that he doesn't want you to miss. Pick it up with me now, chapter four, verse one. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as, was, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest on the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore, it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of, say the word, unbelief. Again, he limits a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, a lot of people come up to me and they say, Pastor, you know, you're not as young as you used to be. By the way, I, I, I really resent that. I'm just, <laughs> you're not either. Anyway, <clears throat> you're not as young as you used to be. And, and, and you need to get plenty more rest. Now, preacher, we worried about you. you. You're just preaching all over the place and you're doing this and that and the other. You, you need rest. Well, the biblical term of rest is a lot different uh, than that term that people use in referring to the physical rest that we have. There's, first of all, the rest that you and I enjoy when we cease trying to get to God on our own and we receive Christ by faith in him, through grace, by grace through faith in him. And we say, you know what, I can't get to God. No way I'm going to get to God is through Jesus. And we rest in that. Then there is the rest uh, that we 
enjoy as we appropriate all that God has in store for us, the fullness of God. Then there is the Sabbath rest that the scriptures is teaching. You know, the Bible says that when, when God got finished all of creation, then he rested. There is that Sabbath rest that talks about us being in Christ and Christ being in us. And then there's the ultimate rest that we're going to enjoy when God calls our number and we get into glory and we enjoy heaven. That's that eternal rest uh, that will be ours. Now, now, now the Hebrews were thrilled to get out of Egypt. They were thrilled that they were set free from bondage. They were excited that they were delivered and that they were on this journey uh, out of Egypt. But the problem was they parked their chariots too close to where they got out. That, that's true of a lot of Christians. We park too close to where we get out and we, if we're not careful, we don't go on into our Canaan. We don't go on into our rest. We get stagnated and stale where we are. Now, there's some aspects of this rest that I want to talk to you about. First of all, I want you to see we are, we are to enter uh, into that rest. You, you know, if you're saved, hear my heart a minute. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, all right, God has already ordained before the foundation of the world that you can go on into the fullness of what he has prepared for you in your life. Before the foundation, look, look with me if you will, verse one, we're back now there. Let us therefore fear lest uh, a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. He, he's addressing the fact that, uh, that the nation of Israel got up to the edge of Canaan, sent over 12 spies, 10 of them came back, said we can't do it. Two of them said, yeah, that, that there was a, uh, an overwhelming negative vote and only a few people were allowed to get into the promised land. And, and so here in the New Testament, uh, these Hebrews were afraid, okay, we, 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 that's already shut up. We, we can't get over. There was only a few allowed to go and, and we're not going to get in. So we, we're going to fall short of getting in on what God has in store for us. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, no, 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 that's not so. I, I just don't want you to fall short of getting in. We are to enter in to that rest. The fact is, there are a lot of people that get saved. There are a lot of people that, that know that they've been delivered from sin on their way to heaven. They, 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 they come to worship and they clap and praise and shout and glory to God and hallelujah and praise the Lamb and all of that stuff. But they stalemate right there. They stagnate right there. And they don't get very far off the launching pad in their relationship with Christ and they never enter into the rest of the Christian life that God has in store for them. They remain there. Colossians chapter two, verse six says this. As you therefore have received Christ, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. That, 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 that's really present perfect tense. He says, walk and keep on walking in him, rooted and built up and established in the faith as you have been taught abounding in thanksgiving. It, it, he says, as you've received the Lord, bask in that love. Keep on that journey. Continue walking with God. Claim his promises. Walk in his power. Enjoy the trip that he's got you involved in. You know, about three or four years ago, uh, Kathy and I and another couple had planned to go on vacation to Scotland. I, I was going to play golf. I don't know what Kathy was going to do, but we were really looking forward to it. Now, I, I had the resort all lined up. Uh, I had the airline tickets 
in my possession. Uh, all, all, everything paid for, ready to go. I had my bags packed and at the foot of the bed so that when I went to bed that night, uh, I'd wake up, take my shower, had my clothes laid out, put my clothes on, head straight to the airport. So I had it all lined up. Went to bed that night, woke up the next morning, and that as far as we got with the trip. We never got to enjoy what had already been lined up. I know a lot of Christians that are just like that. Bags packed, ready to go. Everything paid for, all lined up, but never get to enter in to the joy of the trip. As you've received him, continue in that. I believe there are eight things, eight things that keep us from really, really entering into the fullness of God. You ready for them? Write, write them down. Number one, an absence from the word of God and prayer. I, I'm just gonna tell you this, friend. If the Lord Jesus Christ felt the necessity to pray, if the Lord Jesus Christ felt the necessity to hide the word of God in his heart so that he could stand up against the wiles of the devil, who in the world do we think that we are that we could absence ourselves from the word and prayer and walk in the fullness of God? Number two, you better hold on to this one now. You ready? Harboring bitterness against anyone will keep you from ever enjoying all that God has in store for you. You can't harbor bitterness and still have the joy of the Lord about you. Number three, it's getting entangled with the things of this world. You understand when the Lord Jesus saved you, he called you out of this world. The word says you're still in the world, but you're not of the world. And you can't be entangled in worldly things and still enjoy the fullness of God. Number four, materialism. Buying things that you don't need to impress people. That, by the way, buying things that you don't need with money that you don't have to impress people that you don't even like. <laughs> and you know what happens to that stuff? It gets old. It loses its glamour and winds up in a yard sale. And, and you know what? Just look around. Two or three weeks later after it left your yard, it's in somebody else's. <laughs> hmm? Materialism. Get wrapped up in just stuff will rob you of the fullness of God. Number five, and, 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 and I've got five fingers pointed back at me, busyness. Busyness will rob you of the fullness of God. You, you, one of the things I'm watching Christians everywhere do, they get so wrapped up in doing a lot of good things that they leave the best undone. And when you get so busy that you neglect the word and neglect prayer and neglect to have a priority with your life, it will rob you of the fullness of God. Number six is a lack of fellowship. A lack of fellowship. You understand that the engaging in the fullness of God is a lot more than coming one time a week and sitting in the same old seat, looking at the same back of the head that you look at every week and expect that that is enough. It is not enough. It has never been enough. And you're, not, you're gonna wind up being a casualty in the wilderness left out of all of that God has in store for you if that's the way you approach your Christian life. Number seven, drifting away from worship. Drifting away from worship. Now, now hear my heart a minute. I read an article this week. The title of the, art, the article was, The Church as We Know It is Dead. One of the most disturbing and yet challenging articles that I've read in many, many days. The article goes on to say that church as we know it is dead because we cannot any longer 
centralized, have a centralized location of brick and mortar that we compel people to come to. That we are such a digitized society and culture that if we're going to make a difference that we've got to understand that people are going to get their church from a computer screen. Thank you for the live audience that we have today. I'm grateful to God that you are here and, and grateful that you've tuned in. Grateful that the First Baptist Church Indian Trail provides uh, through uh, Facebook and provides through live stream that gives a podcast that we, we, we record our services so that you can pull them up at any time, anywhere that you may be. I am grateful to God that we're fishing in all of those ponds. And if we can get the gospel into that pond and see people saved, glory to God. But ladies and gentlemen, it is always to get people to understand what was important to the Lord is important to us. And he said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is and even more so when you see the day approaching. Thank God for you. Number eight, it's having a ministry in the church or not having a ministry in the church. We today have churches filled with consumerism. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, they're going from one place to another place trying to figure out who's got the best thing going this Sunday that I can get in on so that I can just soak it up and absorb it all and burp and go home. It, 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 listen, God's looking for contributors. And if you're ever, ever going to see the fullness of God become a reality in your heart and your life, you've got to learn that it can't be just in consumerism that you got to be a contributor somewhere. You ought to discover that God has given you some abilities and talents and spiritual gifts that he intends to use for his glory, whether it's working in the parking lot or in the nursery or whether it's greeting people or ushering or whether it's teaching the word of God. Find a ministry that God can use and bear fruit through you and enjoy what God has in store for you through his fullness. Let me give you number two, you ready? Is the condition of entering that rest. Look with me at verse two. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with, say the next word, faith. That's the condition to entering into the rest of God. It is faith. Faith is the condition. You understand, for by grace are we saved through faith. Faith gets us into the kingdom of God. Are y'all listening? I'm about to preach here in just a minute. It is faith that gets us into the kingdom of God. And it is faith that carries us on in our journey with the Lord. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now watch the term here that he's using in verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached. <laughs> That's good news. And I'm going to tell you, friends, the gospel is good news to some low life, uh, decrepit uh, sinner who's lazy and chewed up and spit out and low down and filthy who deserved death, hell, and the judgment of God. But it was the good news of the gospel that reached down and saved my old wretched soul and delivered me from the bondage of sin and set my, that's the wonderful grace of God. The gospel is good news, but it's not just for the point of entry. But the gospel goes on and carries us on into the fullness of the things that he has prepared for us. You understand that this walk is to be a walk of faith that, that is to be linked up with great anticipation. That is to be linked up uh, with, with expectation of what God is going to do. The writer seems to be saying something here it, is that when the gospel came to them, they didn't really receive it very good because they didn't receive it by faith. You understand that the gospel is like gasoline that God pours out of heaven. And faith is like a lit match 
when the gasoline of the gospel meets up with a lighted match, boom, and wonderful life then is produced. Look, look with me at verse 3. For which we have believed to enter into rest. We, we, we which have believed the gospel. Entered into rest, as he said. As I've sworn in my wrath. If they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. You understand, who were these that were not allowed to go into Canaan? Who were these that are not allowed to go into this, the rest of God? The fullness of God. Remember the word we looked at a minute ago? Those that did not believe. Those that did not live their life by faith. Hey, let, let, me, let me give you a word that you, I want you to take home with you. C could, could I just say, don't make your plans by sight alone. Don't make the plans of your life based on what you can see and taste and smell and hear and feel alone. You, you see, what sets us apart as Christians from the world is that we move and we plan and we operate not by sight, but by faith. N number three, I want to talk to you about the source of this rest. Notice the latter part of verse three. Um, the, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Do you remember in Genesis, when in, in chapter 2, when God was in that creation mode, the Bible says, and the morning and the evening were the first day. And the morning and the evening were, were the second day. And the morning and the evening were the third day and the fourth day and the fifth day and the sixth day. But when it got to the seventh day and God rested, he was pointing to the eternal rest. A lot of, a lot of commentaries believe he was pointing, I do, I, I believe he was pointing to the eternal rest that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ is our Sabbath rest. And if you're in him and he's in you, then you have a faith that is ongoing. That means that Jesus has become the ultimate rest of your life. Period. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you. The Bible says, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and you will find rest for your souls. <laughs> you say, well, I want to tell you what, preacher. I hear you talking about all this rest. I'm just going to say this. Since I've become a Christian, I want to tell you, I hadn't found any rest at all, especially since I joined First Baptist Church in Indian Trail. But I've noticed something. I hope you have. I, I've noticed that uh, when, when I work for Jesus, it's a whole lot different than when I work for the world. When, you know, I, I can spend 23 hours just serving God and serving the Lord and doing the work of God and, and, and just ministry. And, and it energizes me, really. I don't get... But I can spend three hours working in the world and I'm just exhausted, man. I'm blown out, wiped away. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying here, right here in this passage. But the problem is we simply try to do it in our own strength. We bring our burdens to the Lord, but we don't leave them there. One of my favorite commentaries on Hebrews was written um, by John Phillips, great English preacher that I got to hear many, many, many times. And he tells the story about a missionary in Africa who had an old beat-up pickup truck that he got around in. And one day he was uh, on, on one of those roads and he came across this na national 
with a huge, great, big, heavy backpack that he was carrying on his back. And, and he, he kind of felt sorry for the guy. And so he pulled over next to him and he said, sir, how much further do you have to go? And he said, I, I've got about four miles left. And he said, well, why don't you hop back in the back of the truck and, and just let me take you the rest of the way. So the old boy got in the back of the truck in a few minutes. The missionary looks in his rear view mirror and there stands the national with the backpack on his back standing up in the back of the truck. So, so he pulls over, stop, and he says to the national, he said, sir, why don't you take your backpack off and lay it down in the back of the truck? And the national said, well, I just didn't know if the truck could carry both of us or not. <laughs> That's exactly the way most Christians do with God. God, here's my burdens, here's my trials, here's all my junk. God, I want you to handle it for me. But then God doesn't do it the way that we think that he ought to do in the fashion and timing that we think that he ought to do it. And so what do we do? We go in and jump and we take it back and we want to thank God I can do it better. I know better than you do. Let me give you number four. The timing of the rest. The timing of the rest. Look at verse uh, number five. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limits a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time it is said, today, if you will hear his voice and harden not your hearts. You understand, God has set a day to enter into that rest. You say, well, what day is it? Is it Monday? Is it Tuesday? Is it Wednesday? Well, yes. If you're reading this on Monday, then it's Monday. If you're reading this on Tuesday, God speaks to you, then it's on Tuesday. Since we're here today, then today is the day that we say yes uh, to the rest that God has in store for us. Paul writing his second letter to the, the church at Corinth said in chapter number six, he said, today is the day of salvation. There's an urgent appeal that is being made and I'm making it with you today. It, it, it's simply listen, make up your mind Today, today, I'm going to begin to walk by faith. Today, I'm going to believe the promises of God. Today, I'm going to keep on walking with God until God calls me home. Today, I'm going to engage in all of the fullness that God has in store for me. I alluded to this last week. You, you know, thank God that we're saved and we're on our way to heaven once we place our faith and trust in Jesus. And nothing's ever going to take that away from us. And I don't know exactly what the reception is going to be like in heaven, but I can't help but believe the, the Lord's going to welcome us and, you know, here's your mansion over here. And I, I'm glad you trusted me as your Savior. I, I'm glad you put your faith in me. I, I, I'm glad that my blood covered all of your sin. And I, I am grateful for all of that. And, and thank God that you made it here. But I have a question that I want to ask you. Why didn't you believe my promises? Why didn't you trust me for more? Why didn't you let me give you all that I had prepared before the foundation of the world, all that I had prepared for you, just look at everything that you could have enjoyed while you were down here on earth, but you would not believe me for it. All the things that I had planned for you. Can I just say another word to you? Don't walk by sight. Walk by faith. Don't keep looking. And I had the joy of helping a couple this week. Don't get so focused in on your circumstances. Don't live your life by bad news. 
Live your life by the gospel, by the word of God. God says heaven and earth are going to pass away, but my word is going to abide forever. So quit looking at what's going on around you. Quit thinking about ways that you can do something. And trust God. Believe God. Have faith in him. Let, let, let me give you the next one. You ready? The future and ultimate rest is heaven. Look at verse 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us therefore, uh, let, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. How many of you want to go to heaven? Let me see that. If I were getting up a load today, how many of you would want to go? About a fourth of the people that originally raised their hand. You, you, you know, we've already, as children, we've already entered into the rest of his salvation. We, we're on a journey with God to enjoy the rest of the fullness that God has in store for us. Oh, but one of these days... This old ticker is going to quit ticking. And this tent that we've been living in for a little while, that we think is who we really are, is going to lay down in exhaustion. And the real you is going to be left. Not the one that stands in front of a mirror with a tight T-shirt on looking and Look at there, man. Look at that. I'm going to tell you what, folks. That's going to be a saggy bag one of these days that's going to be scooped up and carried to heaven. And the real you that you thought was invincible is going to be left. And we'll be coming into our ultimate or unto our ultimate rest. <laughs> Y'all have seen on television some of these uh, game shows and talk shows. What, what if I were to say to everybody in the room, I have you two tickets today, all expenses paid to the most beautiful resort on the island of Maui for the next two weeks. Doesn't that sound great? I'm going to tell you what, friend. It's nothing compared to what heaven's going to be like. Got good news about this. You understand, you won't have any doctor's appointments because we're going to be healed forever and ever. You won't have any utility bills because the Son of God will be the light of the world. Won't be any food expenses because all you got to do is just go over to the tree and have a gourmet meal every time you get hungry. Won't be any caskets up in heaven because the Bible says there'll be no more death. Won't be any need for Kleenexes in glory because God's going to wipe every tear away in heaven. It's a place of eternal rest. Thank God April the 15th will mean absolutely nothing in heaven. Today I've talked about three things. Talked about three things. I've talked about three prepositions. Into, onto, and unto. I talked about the into, that time when you realize that you're a sinner in need of a savior and you come to Jesus and you come into the rest of salvation. 
I talked about on to. Now that you have come into the rest of salvation, God wants to carry you on to the fullness of your relationship with him so that you don't stay at the point of entry. You keep on enjoying all of the abundance of who he is. I talked to you about the unto. So when you get into Jesus and enjoy the rest of his salvation, you get on to Jesus and you discover the rest of the abundance of God. Then one of these days, he's going to bring you unto himself that where he is, there you may be also. Some of you are here today and you've never gotten into Jesus. And Jesus has never gotten into you. We had three in the last service said that they didn't know Jesus. And they prayed and they asked Jesus to come into their heart and into their life. And he got into them. I wonder how many of you here today, God brought you here today. Because today, do you hear me? Today is the day of your salvation. About 80% of the Christians that are in this room are just like the little girl I've heard Jerry Vines talk about more than once. She fell out of the bed one night in the middle of the night. Her mother comes running in and says, honey, what happened? What happened? And the little girl said, well, mommy, I just got too close to where I got in. And there are a lot of Christians that are just living too close to where you got in. And you're not enjoying the fullness of all that God has prepared for you. And you need to come and say, Lord, I don't, maybe it's one of those eight, but I don't know what's hindering you, but I'm going to ask you to bring it to God today and lay it down and say, you know what? I'm letting this stop me. I'm letting this hinder me from enjoying what you have for me, God. And with your help, I'm not going to do that anymore. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.